D.E.V. Cordigalair, my name is James Nagel, welcome to The Irish Nation Lives. In response to the near total collapse of British authority throughout much of Ireland in early 1920, a series of measures were introduced, delegating power to the army and military-minded men were put in charge of the police. In January, the British Army was given the power to arrest and deport Republicans, and hundreds of arrests were carried out nationwide as the IRA increased their attacks against RIC barracks, driving them out of isolated positions and depriving the army of vital local knowledge. These arrests bolstered the morale of RIC men who had suffered social ostracization since the Dole boycott the previous year and who felt abandoned by the lack of a clear government response. But the hasty release of prisoners by Dublin Castle following a hunger strike in April came as a massive blow and an indication that the Republicans could do whatever they wanted. Police confidence was further broken during the summer assizes, which were held in June and July. Cases of violence and intimidation against the RIC collapsed due to the non-attendance of jurors, and when they did show up, they refused to convict, even in clear-cut cases of guilt. April saw the appointment of General Sir Hugh Tudor as police adviser in Ireland, and he informed the British cabinet that a militarised RIC could break the Republican movement and restore law and order if given the proper support. Though it wouldn't be passed until August, much of the powers that would be granted by the Restoration of Order in Ireland Act were known by June, such as the replacement of trial by jury with courts martial and the introduction of military courts of inquiry to replace coroner's inquests. In a speech in the House of Commons on the 22nd of June, the Attorney General for Ireland, Dennis Henry, outlined the instructions that had been given to British force in Ireland on the initiative that they were to show going forward. He said, The instructions that have been issued are that they are to deal with an attacking party as they would attack enemies in the field. They are to behave in precisely the same way as they would do on the field of battle. If they have reason to suspect that a person approaching them is in possession of deadly weapons, they are to call on him to put up his hands and, failing his doing so, they are to fire upon him. When Henry was asked if this meant that the government would support a member of the military who shot and killed anyone who approaches them in a threatening manner, he responded, Certainly they will be supported, and it cannot be too widely known. The implications here are quite stark. British forces can now shoot to kill in cases where someone appears to be suspect or threatening. They should do so knowing that they will have the full support of the government, and if an investigation into the shooting is carried out, it will be done so by a military court of inquiry. It's in the middle of all this that a dispatch arrived at the RIC barracks in Listowel, County Kerry, on the 16th of June. The dispatch instructed that the barracks was to be handed over to the British Army the following morning and the majority of the men stationed there were to be redeployed to other barracks around the county to act as scouts for the army. The men felt uneasy about the orders as it would make them complicit in military action against the Irish people and they held a meeting at which they appointed Constable Jeremiah Mee from Galway as their representative. He suggested that instead of accepting the transfer the men should arm themselves and refuse to hand over the barracks. This was agreed, and the decision was communicated to the county inspector in Tralee. The next morning, shortly before the handover was to take place, the county inspector arrived to berate the men and suggested that anyone who wasn't willing to carry out the orders should resign. When all 14 men stepped forward and offered their resignations, he backtracked and said that if they wrote out their complaints, he would submit them to the proper quarter, following which he left. Late the following evening, on the 18th of June, they received a message to be ready for parade the next morning to meet Lieutenant Colonel Smith, the Divisional Commissioner for Munster, who had ordered the handover. Gerald Bryce Ferguson Smith had embarked for France with the expeditionary forces in August of 1914, and in October of that year he was struck by shrapnel while trying to rescue an NCO during heavy artillery fire, resulting in the amputation of his left arm below the elbow. He was given the Distinguished Service Order and could probably have seen out the rest of the war on a wounds pension, but instead begged to be readmitted for service. In April of 1915 he was appointed second in command of the 90th Field Company of the 9th Division, where he served under General Sir Hugh Tudor. When Tudor was appointed Police Advisor for Ireland in 1920, he suggested Smith for the position of Divisional Commissioner for Munster, a role which he took up on the 3rd of June. On the 19th of June, a military detachment of at least 50 men with rifles and swords escorted Smith 
Tudor and a number of other high-ranking officials, all in full-dress uniform, when they arrived at Lestole. Smith immediately addressed the men in the day room, outlining the reasoning behind the decision to hand over the barracks and the support that they would be given in future. Afterwards, Me wrote out the speech and sent it to Erskine Childers, who reproduced it in the Irish Bulletin, a fact sheet published by Thal Aaron. From here, it was picked up by the Freeman's Journal, which was suppressed by the British in the aftermath of its publication. Smith later denied that the speech printed was anything like what he delivered, but it contains many points which would be later backed up by the Attorney General's speech on the 22nd of June, the Restoration of Order in Ireland Act, and by the activities of the British forces going forward. While the speech as printed may have been embellished, it seems to be an accurate depiction of the policy Britain was formulating for dealing with Ireland. The full version of the speech can be found in Mee's Bureau of Military History statement, which is linked in the description below, but it is worth quoting at length the main points given. Smith told the men, Sinn Féin has had all the sport up to this. We are going to have the sport now. Martial law, applying to all Ireland, is coming into operation shortly. The military are to take possession of the large centres where they will have control of the railways and lines of communication, and be able to move rapidly from place to place. If a police barracks is burned, or if the barracks already occupied is not suitable, then the best house in the locality is to be commandeered, the occupants thrown out in the gutter. Let him die there, the more the merrier. Police and military will patrol the country roads at least five nights a week. They are not to confine themselves to the main roads, but take across country, lie in ambush, and, when civilians are seen approaching, shout, hands up. Should the order be not immediately obeyed, shoot, and shoot with effect. If the persons approaching carry their hands in their pockets, or are in any way suspicious looking, shoot them down. You may make mistakes occasionally, and innocent persons may be shot, but this cannot be helped, and you are bound to get the right persons sometimes. The more you shoot, the better I will like you, and I assure you that no policeman will get in trouble for shooting any man. In the past, policemen have gotten into trouble for giving evidence at coroner's inquests. As a matter of fact, inquests are to be made illegal, so that in future no policeman will be asked to give evidence. Hunger strikers will be allowed to die in jail, the more the merrier. In his Bureau of Military History statement, Mee says that he called Smith a murderer after he outlined his policy, to which the divisional commissioner ordered that he be arrested. Mee was held briefly in the kitchen before his colleagues burst in and took him back to the day room. Smith and the others departed shortly afterwards, leaving the RIC men in place. Believing themselves to be targets, many of them would leave in the weeks ahead, but, intentionally or not, the Lestole mutiny had achieved a massive propaganda victory for the Republican movement. Mee would later travel to Dublin to provide a sworn statement of the events to members of Dáil Éireann, and after absconding from the RIC, he was hired by Countess Markievicz to work in the Department of Labour, assisting men who had resigned from the police force. After Mee's statement was published in the Freeman's Journal, Smith was summoned to London, where he denied that he had said anything that was out of line with the statements made by the Attorney General. The public fury caused by the printed speech made him a marked man, and Sean O'Hegarty, Vice Commandant of the Cork No. 1 Brigade, ordered that he be shot. Smith was known to frequent the county club in Cork, and on the 17th of July 1920, up to 13 men entered the building and shot him dead. The killing of a distinguished war hero and high-ranking RIC officer deeply shocked the government and caused severe unrest in parts of Ulster. There was a delay in sending Smith's coffin by train to Banbridge, County Down, for burial, as railway men in Cork refused to handle it as part of the wider boycott against the British forces. This, and building tensions following weeks of sectarian violence, led to three days of rioting in Belfast, where thousands of Catholic workers were forced out of their jobs in Harland and Wolfe and other major businesses. The election of the first ever nationalist mayor of Derry in January and increased IRA activity in the city stoked unionist fears. Violence would spread throughout the region and the killing of RIC men connected to the province, such as Smith and Oswald Swansea in August, resulted in rioting and reprisals against the nationalist Catholic communities. At the same time as the incident in Kerry, but at the other end of the world, conditions in Ireland were sparking off another mutiny. 
On the 28th of June, members of the Connacht Rangers, based in northern India, grounded their arms and refused to carry out military duties in protest against the actions of the British Army in Ireland. The protest spread to other companies of the Connacht Rangers, who handed in their weapons and refused to soldier any longer. But on the 1st of July, around 30 Rangers, led by Private James Daly, attempted to retake their weapons and were fired upon, with two of the protesters being killed. What the British may have looked upon as an act of indiscipline was now viewed as a full-scale mutiny. Loyal regiments were dispatched to restore order, and many of the Rangers were arrested and court-martialed. 61 of them were convicted, with 14 sentenced to death. These were commuted to penal servitude in all but one case. On the 2nd of November, the day after Kevin Barry was hanged in Dublin, Private James Daly was executed by firing squad in India. He was 21 years of age, and the last British soldier to be shot for mutiny. There were many reasons for the outbreak of the mutiny, and conditions in the barracks may have had as much to do with it as conditions in Ireland. Hindu nationalists viewed it as an act of anti-imperial solidarity, and some saw the peaceful protests, which were met by British force, as an adoption of Mahatma Gandhi's principles of civil disobedience. We often forget that Ireland was just one tiny part of a much larger struggle against colonial and imperial rule worldwide. Ho Chi Minh had attended rallies of the Irish Self-Determination League in London, and Hindu nationalists had taken part in the St. Patrick's Day Parade held in New York, which was attended by Eamon de Valera, just a few months earlier. Those imprisoned for their role in the mutiny were transferred to England, and were released in January of 1923 following the establishment of the Irish Free State. Some joined the National Army, or, radicalised by their period of imprisonment, the Irish Republican Army. Stripped of their service entitlements, it was 1936 before the Irish government awarded them a pension. On the 50th anniversary of the Connacht Rangers' mutiny in 1970, James Daly's body was repatriated to Ireland and buried in Glasnevin. In July of 1920, Gerald Smith's funeral was described as the biggest that Banbridge had ever seen. Political, military and police dignitaries travelled from all around Ireland, but one person who couldn't attend was his brother Osbert, then serving with the army in Egypt. Desperate for revenge, Osbert joined the intelligence services in Dublin to fight the IRA. But in October, he would be buried besides his brother, following a dramatic gun battle with Dan Breen and Sean Tracy. By then, backed by the Restoration of Order in Ireland Act, the Auxiliaries and the Black and Tans had begun a campaign of terror against the Irish population and had driven the IRA on the run, forcing them to form the famous Flying Columns. I'll be covering these events and others in future episodes. If you haven't done so already, please subscribe and check out the social media links in the description. Accorda, thank you for joining me on The Irish Nation Lives. Slongafol.